<laughs> well, hello everybody and uh, welcome to this Q&A. My name's Downsy. I'm a volunteer uh, at the Suspension Bridge and I'm very, very pleased to introduce uh, Trish Johnson, of course, who is the bridge master who's going to be introducing uh, herself very shortly. But let me just read your uh, bio, Trish, from the website. Uh, it says you are a chartered really? civil engineer and former regional director of the Institution of Civil Engineers with several years experience and no stranger to iconic structures. So apart from the Clifton <laughs> Suspension Bridge, you, you, have, you have touched many other iconic structures and, and managed a few too. So first of all, Trish, welcome. Thank you very much for your time today. And tell us a little Thank bit you. about your history and how you came to the bridge. Um, well, as you said, um, I studied civil engineering at uni, so um, I was always keen on, on doing something um, sort of with regards to maths and physics and solving problems, and, and engineering seemed to be the, the right thing to do for me. Um, and I ended up going to a university in Salford, and part of that meant I had a year right in industry, and that year was on the Severn Bridge, uh, the first Severn Bridge, so I worked there for a year as a student. Um, and then once I qualified, I went into a consultancy office and did a lot of sort of design um, and work with um, bridges, but also with um, soil mechanics, geotechnics, highways, drainage, sewers. Sewers were a big thing. Um, and, uh, and then eventually I progressed into um, managing a, a bridge, the bridges office in Bristol and then on to managing the whole office. And during that time, you know, bridges obviously was a big focus. So um, I looked after the, inspected the bridges on the M4 and the M5. So that meant me going out in a cherry picker in rain and snow, uh, looking after them and uh, inspecting the M25 bridges during closures at night. Um, and so, yeah, so bridges for some reason became my, my, my area of um, specialism, I suppose. And um, over the years, I, I've sort of continued with that. And, um, and then I decided to move into the um, in promoting engineering to schools and to, and to people and to um, making sure our, our engineers themselves are qualified. So I became regional director for the Institution of Civil Engineers. And I really enjoyed that because that was looking at the positive side of engineering and looking at the positive projects. But I missed the problem solving. I missed that, you know, how can we do this and how can we manage this? So I ended up going back to the Severn Bridge after all these years and worked on the Severn Bridge for a couple of years um, before this role of um, Bridge Master came up and being a Bristol person. I know the accent isn't um, Bristolian, but I've been, I've, I spent all my working life in Bristol. The chance of looking after such a fantastic bridge, um, I couldn't, um, I could not um, try and go for it, which I did and I was very lucky. Uh, to get the job and um, so here I am. So when did the, the Clifton Suspension Bridge sort of first enter your your radar? How old were you when you first walked across and so on? Well I, I obviously wasn't here when I was young but um, when I came to Bristol in uh, to work on the Severn Bridge I, I lived in, um, in Filton and um, my parents came over to see me and family came over to see me and uh, part of my tour was the um, was always the Clifton Suspension Bridge. So uh, a long time, probably 30, 30 years ago. <laughs> so when this um, opportunity and, uh, came just, up to when this opportunity came up, um, it must have sort of been quite you know the pit, pit of your stomach because it sounds like it was a job you desperately wanted. Yeah, well, you know, it, it, it's it's on my on my doorstep in a way. I know I, I don't live far away from from the bridge. Um, and so it, it's, and it is obviously the, the um, you know, something you see as you come back from, you know, from holidays, it's that, you know, you, you look up and you see the lights are on or the bridge and think, ah, we're back home. And, uh, you know, to be able to look after something like that, that the city loves and adores, um, you know, was, was very, you know, I was very humbled <laughs> to be allowed to be able to look after it. And uh, I know I've got a lot of responsibility on my shoulders to make sure it stays in good condition. We'll, we'll, we'll get on to more of that a little bit later on. Let's go into some of the questions now. We've had uh, quite a lot of questions also from the South Bristol Youth, of course, a, a fantastic organisation that uh, should have been coming to see the bridge and unfortunately, of course, because of the circumstances, yeah. uh, aren't able to at the moment. But the first question is, could you please describe your job? Gosh, there's a big opener. Yeah, that is a big one. So basically, um, 
as, as bridge master, I am really looking after the whole, uh, the bridge in, in its entirety. The bridge is it's, it's run privately, it's run by a trust. So basically anything that happens on the bridge or is um, involved in the bridge is, is my responsibility or the trust's responsibility. So it's, it's basically running a business. So we've got the, the bridge itself. So you've got to look after the, the maintenance of the bridge. You've got to look after um, any major projects that we're doing at the minute where refurbishing the hangers which are the vertical rods that hang from the chains onto the deck so we're refurbishing them so it's managing all the, the projects the contractors uh, the people on the bridge but then as a business you're also managing um you know we've got a team of employees our staff and um, that's the uh, bridge attendants um, the people in the admin office and then obviously uh, the team itself in the in the visitor center as well so you know it's managing all of that plus we also take a toll from the bridge, so there's the money coming in, um, and we have to look at how you know making sure that's get collected, gets fine, the finance behind it. So it's um, it's like a business, like running a business really, with a with a bridge as as the major focus of it. Um, and then all of that I report into the uh, trustees, and they are volunteers themselves, um, and so I report into them on a regular basis as to how everything's going um, and make sure that they're happy with with what's you know what me and the team are are doing so is there is there a sort of typical day for you or a typical week that's one of the questions is what your typical week looks like <laughs> yeah it's interesting and that's part of the reason why i love the job so much is that no two days are the same you know i'd come in one day and i'd say right today i'm just going to work out i'm going to sort out this contract today and then I get a phone call and I'll get something completely different happen. Somebody wants to take a dinosaur across the bridge <laughs> and suddenly, you know, oh, right, we need to see how we can do that. You know, so it, every day is different. But I suppose most of, most of the time I, I come in, I check my emails, see if there's anything that's um, that maybe members of the public have query, queries about or, or questions about. Um, if, I've, if I've got any dealings with our local stakeholders, you know, Mississippi Council, North Somerset Council. And then I look at what projects or what work we're planning for the day. So I'd look at that, make sure that's all in planned and we've got everything in place for that. Um, then I'd look and see what, um, what, you know, in terms of the tooling, have we had any problems with our machines? Have we had any problems with, you know, with the, the cameras and things like that, that they've been that they've, they've reported in? So, um, you know, all of that, that's just sort of normal day. But then on top of that, you get all sorts of different things that come through. We get the media ringing up wanting to, to do some filming on the bridge. We want people who want to, you know, light the bridge in different colors, which unfortunately we can't do, but we get lots of inquiries about that. Um, and then we, you know, we've, we've just got to, um, you know, then the, the, gen, the general issues with, with the business as well, you know, uh, a camera goes down, uh, you know, uh, something needs to be um, changed, the uh, cash needs to be sorted out, things like that. Gosh. So I think the short answer is no, there isn't, there isn't such <laughs> I'm a... I'm sorry, I've got difficult... on a bit. <laughs> no, no, not at all. It's fascinating. This is, this is why we're here. We are, we're, we're loving to, to hear all about it. But I think that my point being that it's difficult to pinpoint a, a typical week because yeah. with such a, an iconic structure and the nature of business, actually, um, whether you're looking after, you know, a, 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 a listed bridge or whether it's a big finance company, actually, the challenge of business is different every day. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and that's, that's what we have. And that's what, that's what's quite exciting about it as well. So it, it, you never get bored. You know, you, you've always got something different to do. Um, there's always, there's always something that needs to be um, looked at and considered. And, uh, and that's what, you know, that's why it makes me happy coming to work every day. Good. Right. Let's move on and have a look at some more questions here. Uh, so how do you become a bridge master is a is another question from a, one of our SBY students. Yeah. OK, well, it's not something I sort of thought that, I, you know, I'm going to aim to be a bridge master because that's quite narrow in the field because there's not that many bridge masters around anymore. Um, obviously, there's been a bridge master at the bridge since it's been um, since it's been built. It's a, a title. But really what what the bridge master um, in the more modern terms is, is somebody who is a, got a background in engineering. So for me, um, or for, the, for the role of bridge master, you needed to be a chartered civil engineer. So really um, for me to get to this level, I had to sort of go to university, do a degree in um, civil engineering or something civil, similar. Um, and then, you know, you, you would need um, 
you know, years of experience in terms of um, managing bridges, maintaining bridges, um, inspecting bridges, um, and which is what, what I've got. Um, and then, you know, you can, you would obviously then progress to um, being a bridge master. But you know, I think that the background is having an experience in bridges, having a, de a degree in civil engineering or, or related um, or related sort of degree. Uh, but you know, to be a civil engineer these days, you, you don't always have to go to university. You can um, you can do an apprenticeship and go through um, a route that way. Um, to or you can um, you know you can do a, a diploma in it in civil engineering and then progress with a company who maybe helps you through the training. So it's not always having to go to university. There's lots of other ways of doing it. There's lots of um, you know ways of you can work and, and study at the same time so for anybody who's is interested in it there's, there's lots of information out there about it must be um because it's quite a cool title bridge master you know yeah. sounds cool doesn't it and you must be very proud that you know your name is now going to be on that uh, you know not particularly long list of incumbents at clifton suspension bridge yeah well i mean the bridge is over 150 years old so we, we don't know how many bridge masters there there are i mean our archivist we maybe need to get her to have a look and see exactly how many there were but um there's been a bridge master here since the bridge was open so usually i would say bridge masters tend to last last about 10 years and uh, they do you know that's usually a senior a senior engineer or senior person who comes in um and it's so you know that being said there's probably been about 15 if you know around that i'm guessing mm. um Previously, years ago, they didn't have to be um, engineers. A lot of them came from uh, the army and the forces, and they seemed to find that towards the end of their career, they um, they, they would become, uh, they'd look after the bridge and, and all of that. But as things have progressed and as the bridges got older, and maybe because we need more maintenance and we need to look after it a bit more, um, they focus more on having the bridge master as an engineer. What sort of um, percentage split do you think is uh, of your time is spent doing actual engineering related compared to you know management organizational admin um i would say it's probably 75 percent is sort of managing the trust and managing the business and dealing with people the 25 percent is probably the engineering the good thing is i've got a lot of consultants or I, you know some consultants and contractors who do a lot of the work so it's a case of of managing them and then they get on and do the day-to-day -day sort of supervision of the of the work on the bridge you know if it's a big project but yeah it's it's like i mean i used to work i used to run the bridges and the highways office in trowbridge um and again you know it was it was 80 members of staff and the majority you think well, you know i'll get into all the different projects but but with that you tend to take it's more about the management of the business rather than the the engineering sure. but you know it's a, it's a good mix um if i needed to i can do more on on either so um it's that's quite good lovely okay next up do you go right to the top if so do you ever get wobbly looking down again from one of our students <laughs> yes i've been to the very top of the towers so you can it's to get to them you have to go up a ladder then there's a little sort of um, cradle and then you get to the very top of the portal and then you go out onto the roof so I've done that um, I'm, I'm really lucky I, I have a good head for heights um, when I was on the Severn Bridge I have I walked the cables from the bottom right up to the top um, which I really enjoyed um, I mean going up it, it's not too scary because you can you just see a big cable in front of you but when you turn around and come back down again it's like the world has just opened up in front of you and you know you're this tiny person and you know it's it is amazing if you're very safe you're very safe I don't do anything dangerous it's always I'm always you know locked on and um, harnessed on but um, usually when I go anywhere on holiday or um, to a new place I always try to find the highest point so that I can have a good view across so yeah heights is not something I'm worried about it's kind of essential isn't it having a good head for heights in your business <laughs> yeah I suppose so though I have had I do know bridge engineers who are not very happy crossing <laughs> the Clifton suspension bridge um, <laughs> and that's only on the foot way so wow. um, you don't always have to have a good head for heights it does help I mean if you're a, if you're designing bridges in the office then I suppose 
you're okay. You, you, you know, you don't have to have that. Um, you don't have to overcome that fear. Um, and not all bridges are as, as high as a Clifton. No, I guess. I guess that's true. <laughs> Very good. And here's one now from Twitter. This is uh, Emma Newrick. Thank you, Emma, for your question. And she'd like to ask, what's the best part of being a bridge master? Oh, gosh. Well, I think I, I probably have answered that. It's, um, it's the variety, you know, it's, it's the chance to be able to look after such a fantastic um, listed structure, but also to be able to engage with um, schools, you know, talk to schools like, like today and, and go out to schools and talk to them about um, engineering. And, and then also, you know, have you know, the, the volunteers and the, and, the, and the members of the public being able to engage with them on a, you know, as I walk the bridge and talk to them. It's, um, and who, who couldn't, who, who wouldn't want an office like mine where your, your office is just the bridge, you know, it's just fantastic to, to be able to go to that every day and that's, that's your place of work. Isn't it funny? I mean, you know, we have a passion for bridges in common as I, I've been a volunteer for a long time. And um, uh, I, I think there's a there's a sort of small little group of us that isn't quite so small that are passionate about bridges. What, what do you think it is about those structures that really draws people in? Because it's a, you know, the, the amount of visitors that we get, it's I mean, it's amazing, isn't it? Well, the, yeah, for the for the Clifton Suspension Bridge itself, I suppose it's 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 its location, um, it's the fact that it is so old, um, and it just seems to float in in air above the gorge. Um, but for for all bridges, I think it's all about it's connecting two places, isn't it? It's about you know you, you know two two separate communities are being connected, and um, and you know usually that's done with some grandeur, and you know bridges tend to be a sort of a, a landmark feature. So, you know, when you go to any, any sort of city or, or country, you know, some of those bridges, you know, you go to see the bridges and they, they make a real effort with bridges. Um, and I think, you know, that's what drives, brings tourists, you know, you're, 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 you're bridging over a gorge or a river. So you're going to have some usually quite pretty views as well. So people go for the views as well, not just of the bridge, but you turn the other way and, and look out at, at, what, um, at what you can see. Uh, I'll remove the, the Clifton Suspension Bridge from your possible answers for this, but um, do you have another favourite bridge? Well, I must say the, um, the first seven crossing is still uh, quite a favourite of mine as well, just because it was the first bridge I really worked on. Um, I've got you know, sort of got quite sentimental with it. Um, and then went back to that work there as head of engineering. So it, it, has, it has got a, a special place in my heart as well. But um, I, there's some fantastic bridges out there. I mean, I, the Malaya Viaduct is one of, is on my list of ones to go to see. I still haven't been there, um, so I want to go and see it. And last year, the, there was a bridge called the it's called the Golden Bridge, and it's in Vietnam, and it's got two hands that hold it up, suspended in. It looks like it's been suspended in midair by these two golden hands. Um, so I sort of did a bit of a detour with the family so that we could go. <laughs> <laughs> we could go up and see that bridge. <laughs> so um, yeah, I tend to have a see what bridges are around and have go and have a look at them. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic! We were we, we were going to North Wales for a friend of mine stag do recently, and I just happened to plan the route in round the Menai Bridge. Was, oh gosh, how have we got here? Uh -huh. <laughs> no, like... <laughs> 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 Great. Let's move on to another one of our questions then. And this is about the team. And the question is, what jobs or careers are available at the bridge? Right. So we, we've got a small team of, um, of um, you know, our team's quite small. There's probably about 25, 26 of us. And um, so the jobs you, you can do at the bridge, you've got, we've got our um, bridge attendants. So they look after, they're the sort of day to day, they look after the bridge. They're like the curators of the bridge. And they make sure that uh, the bridge isn't, doesn't come to any harm. They make sure that people can cross safely and uh, the cars can cross safely. Um, and they monitor the, the cameras as well to make sure that nobody's you know, doing anything wrong on the bridge. So um, there's a team of them. So that's one, one um, career. Then we've also got um, an accountant and an archivist. Uh, we've got some admin team. So they manage the, um, uh, the tolling, the, the bridge cards that people use to cross the bridge. And then we have our whole team of... Um, in the visitor centre and visitor services. So we've got, you know, careers in um, managing um, a visitor centre and, um, and managing sort of 
social media accounts and websites and all of that. And then we have maintenance as well, where you can be, a, you know, we've got a, a maintenance operative and uh, he can, he sort of manages the day-to-day -day maintenance and any sort of smaller type of maintenance that doesn't need uh, major contractors. So there's different careers. Um, we, we don't tend to have a lot of turnover on the bridge. Um, I think if people come here, they tend to like to stay. Um, so, um, you know, there's, 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 not, there's not often um, opportunities that come up very often for, for those roles, but when they do, there's always a lot of interest in them. And then obviously people like yourselves who we can't do without, the volunteers on the, on the bridge, you know, uh, they, they are the, um, the backbone of what we do. So it's important that um, there's, there's careers and then there's the volunteer career as well. Highly recommended, by the way. If anybody has some time and they would like to come and volunteer, please get in touch on the website. The more, the merrier. Uh, very good. Let's talk about some tolls and traffic now, then, in this set of questions. Uh, and uh, here's another uh, question from one of our students Is the bridge still a toll bridge? And if so, how much does it cost? Yeah, it's still a toll bridge. It's been a toll bridge ever since it was built. Um, and the reason for that, as I said, it's a private bridge. It's not run by Bristol City Council. It's not run by North Somerset. It's a private bridge. So the money that we get from the tolls is used to maintain the bridge. And as the bridge gets older, we need a bit more money to, to maintain it. Um, and the toll is a pound. It was um, increased a number of years back from 50p to a pound, and it remains at a pound ever since. Um, and then all of that money is used towards the um, maintaining it. Can I just clarify how much money that the councils give to the bridge for the maintenance and the upkeep, please? Zero. <laughs> yeah, so we get no money from anywhere else. We don't get any money from the councils or government. Basically, the money that the tolls, um, we get from the tolls is, is all that we use to pay for the maintenance and to pay for the team as well. So, um, you know, it's important that it's managed, we manage it correctly and uh, we take care as to what exactly we're going to focus on our expense, expenditure on. I think a lot of people are surprised when they, certainly from the tours that I've done, when you say that actually there's no yeah. government funding or, or local government funding yeah. and it purely survives on the tolls. That, that's quite surprising to a lot of people because it is such an iconic structure and, you know, the wonder of Bristol and the ornament of the age. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it is, you know, if you're looking at tourists information about Bristol, you know, the bridge comes up there. And so, you know, in a way we are bringing we are bringing people to Bristol. Um, but um, and it's a key it's a key route across from, um, you know, North Somerset to Bristol. You know, it's, it is used a lot. Um, but we, we're managing, I mean, with the tolls and people continuing to use the tolls, which is what we need. <laughs> then uh, we do have enough income to, to support our maintenance projects. I should correct myself on misquoting, the ornament of Bristol and the wonder of the age is the quote that I was desperately trying to get out there to look impressive. <laughs> now, let's move on to our next question. Why do people have to pay to get across it? I think you've probably covered that. Covered that one, I think, yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you count the number of vehicles and pedestrians crossing, says CJ Tickler. Um, we count the number of vehicles, so every time uh, the barrier is lifted, um, it's counted as obviously one vehicle. So we can we can work out exactly how much um, how many vehicles have crossed the bridge each day, and we usually get probably people are asking around an average of about seven to ten thousand vehicles a day across the bridge. Um, so we do we do count the vehicles. We don't count pedestrians, and it is something that. I'm thinking of looking at doing it at some stage because we sort of quote, you know, there's three million, two million, half a million pedestrians visit the bridge every year, but we're not really sure exactly how many. So it would be something that we should maybe look at in the future. Um, the, the other way, what we also do in terms of vehicles is that we have a, a way bridge on both sides of the, of the bridge as well. So um, if a vehicle crosses that that's over four tonne, then um, alarm sound, the barriers lock down and they have to um, reverse or turn round because the bridge can only take, as you know, has, a, has got a four ton weight limit on it. And that's when we find out how good these people are at driving their vehicles, right? That's correct. <laughs> that's when our bridge attendants come out on the, onto their own, you know, they are very helpful and they turn people around, stop the traffic um, and, and move, move the vehicle 
back from the from the bridge. And we've had, you'd be surprised at how many vehicles. We've had uh, removal vans, massive big removal vans, come up and say, you know, can we get across? No, you know, all sorts of vehicles. Um, we had a, an abnormal load route and it was going to be coming across the bridge until I spotted it and said, no, you can't come across the bridge, it's only four tons. So you do get people, you know, obviously if they're following sat nav as well, they do get a bit confused and um, so we, we turn them around. Yeah, I think the, the suspension bridge and the residents of Barrow Gurney probably cursed the day that uh, sat nav was invented. <laughs> um, one of the questions here is, um, what is the most unusual vehicle that has crossed the bridge. It's come from VJ Rogers on Twitter. Thank you very much. Uh, any memories of an unusual vehicle? Well, I've been here, um, I said three, three years I've been here now at the bridge. So for me personally, the most unusual one was when a dinosaur, a robotic dinosaur, so were escaped from, well, it escaped in, in, from the back of a, a, a trailer and ran across the bridge. Um, and it was to promote Bristol Zoo. Um, so that was quite an unusual vehicle, but we've also had um, Sean Nick Park, I think, from Ardman Animation. He he had a trailer full of Sean the sheep, and they crossed the bridge. We've had elephants, um, robots. Obviously, our police horses cross, and we have those, um, and a couple of tractors as well. I think some of them was was um, some an advertising Walker's crisps. I think so. We had a tractor <laughs> crossing that with Walker's crisps. Yeah. It's sort of becoming more and more popular for, you know, for things like filming and you see lots of documentaries. I mean, you know, does, does a month go by without TV cameras being on the bridge? Um, they do. They do like the bridge as a background or to, to do some filming on it. So we have had some um, we have had some filming up there. Sometimes I can't say uh, what it was because it's all top secret. Um, but every now and again, you, you look at the, a new series that's based in Bristol and you think, oh, there's the bridge. So we do, we do get quite a lot of um, requests for it. Obviously, we have to maintain the traffic going across the bridge. So, you know, some film crews will say we want to shut the bridge for a week. Is that possible? And you say, well, no, it can't be. So we have to manage, we have to manage the requests um, with obviously making sure that we don't impact too much on, the, on the, our users. The, um, the, the pedestrians and the and the car users, and presumably the same for those uh, adventure sport type people, all the people that want to tie themselves to the bridge and fly off it or jump off it. I mean, you know, you, you presumably must get a lot of those requests too. But that's not allowed. It's not permitted. We're not allowed. I mean, it's part of our um, our act that we no bungee jumping or 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 um, you know park or whatever it's parkour what it's called on the bridge it's just too dangerous um and we just we don't allow it and if anybody does come up they get reported to the police so uh, it would be nice i know that and a lot of them do request it but um there's probably safer places to do it and um, so we advise them to do it somewhere else and I think it's, you know, we, we must remember that it's a, it's a very busy road as well, isn't it? And any kind of closure, whether it be for charity, uh, you know, or, or whatever, is, is really disruptive when the bridge closes, isn't it? It is. So we have to try and work at, you know, at, at quite, if we do decide to do, if they want to do some filming, and it is possible. Um, before, before lockdown, obviously, we could close a footway and maybe they could do some filming in one footway and the pedestrians could use the other, other footway. Um, so that was possible. Um, it's a bit more tricky at the minute, obviously, because we've got a, a one-way route going around. So I don't think there's much filming going on anyway during lockdown. But um, I'm sure the request will, once it's um, lifted, I'm sure we're, the request will come back in again. <laughs> well, it's nice to know that we're all being kept safe with all of the, the regulations and the rules that are in place. Let's go back to some more of our questions here. And... Uh, Per, part of our history section. Uh, who was the first person to cross the bridge? All right, you probably know this, Dinesy, but um, I understand it was a woman called Mary Griffiths, and um, they, when they were about to open the bridge, they had gates across each side of the bridge, um, and then there was like an official opening, and they opened the gates, and this this woman, Mary Griffiths. Uh, she sprinted across the bridge so that she would be the, the first person to, to cross it. And it's nice that it was a woman, to be honest, but there we go. Yeah. So it was a woman called Mary Griffiths. 
brilliant. I love the imagery as well of the of the sort of the hustle and the bustle. Yeah, lifting and... your skirts and charging. <laughs> Perfect. Very good. Uh, when did cars first start going over the bridge, please? Um, there's no official date as to when they actually um, crossed the bridge, but I presume it would be when cars were first invented in what, 1920s. Um, so they they um, would have been going across from then. I do know that it goes back in the archives that they were they did look at the onset of vehicles coming across the bridge because they designed the bridge for horses and carts and, and that side of things. So there was some strengthening carried out to the anchorages, which are there where the chains are, are bolted into the rock um, in the late, in the sort of 40s, just to be sure um, that the bridge was strong enough to withstand any um, vehicle loading. Great, lovely. Um, here's, a bit, here's a big question, another one from our uh, SBY students. What else did Brunel build? Well, you're the expert I hear on Brunel, so you probably know more than I do on this. <laughs> he built quite a lot, didn't he? He was quite prolific. Yeah, yeah. So what do you want to say a few? <laughs> um, yeah, so the, obviously the Great Western Railway um, and lots of the stations in between. Uh, was one of my, I'm a bit of a train owner. I fall into that category of trains and bridges and industrial revolution and so on and so yeah. forth. Um, I think one of the, the most fascinating inventions for me uh, was the atmospheric railway that never oh, really yes. took off. But um, it was a great idea, wasn't it? And, and lots of people say that perhaps, you know, if it was invented now, then maybe it would have been a bit more successful. Um, but I think probably the, the, the famous bridge over the, over the Tamar, I think, with his, with his name emblazoned. Have you ever been across? Yeah, yeah, I have. I've been down there, yeah. Yeah, pretty impressive. I mean, he really was at the forefront of, as we call it, integrated transport. You know, he, he basically allowed all the different forms of transport to link in together. So he had it from, you know, you had your, your, your trains, your railway, your, your railway station, then the train, and then you got off that and you crossed over a bridge, the vehicles, and then you got onto the boat and you went to America. So you had the whole integration of transport. Um, and even he threw in a few hotels along the way to make sure that people were comfortable when they were waiting. So he, he had, he was um, an amazing character. I mean, to think of, Usually you focus on one area and he was he was doing tunneling, he was doing bridges, he was doing railways. And and for such a, a young mind as well, because he, you know, he um he was doing all this in his twenties, you know, so it's pretty exactly. impressive. And not only doing all of that, but also doing it really well and beautifully and with detail. And, you know, you just need to look at like the lampposts at Paddington Railway Station that were part of his design. And it wasn't just functional, but it was beautiful and pretty wasn't it yeah yeah definitely and he had some really great designs and great ideas for the, the clifton suspension bridge as well you know he had he was going to have this egyptian theme you know the sphinxes and and it was all going to be cladded with how the bridge was built which would have been really interesting you know all about the information but um sadly obviously um he ran out of money or and uh, that didn't happen so um maybe we need to bring the sphinxes back <laughs> <laughs> that would be an attraction, wouldn't it? Goodness me. I love the story that they tell about the Sphinxes and the people of Clifton being upset that originally the Sphinxes were going to look inwards towards the middle of the gorge. So on approach to the bridge, you'd be faced with the bottom of the Sphinx, which they were unhappy with. <laughs> Not the top of the head. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Right, back to our questions. Let's have a look. Uh, if the, this was a brilliant question. Thank you very much for this one. Uh, if the bridge was to be designed today, in what ways might it be different? Would it still be a suspension bridge or would there be benefits to it being a different type of bridge altogether? This is from Catherine McIntosh at the Innovation Festival. All right. Um, obviously, when it was built, you know, it was ahead of its time in terms of being a suspension bridge and it was one of the longest spans, you know, you could, you could do at the time. But nowadays, you know, you just have to look into um, East Asia or Asia and see the sort of size of some of the suspension bridges that we're doing now. So um, for the, a 200 metre span, which is what we've got now, probably a suspension bridge might not be the, the most effective bridge um, nowadays. Um, so you might want to look at, you know, there's, there's other options around that, might, you know, if we were to replace it, um, you could have like a, um, a, an arch 
um, a metal arch, a bit like the Sydney Harbour Bridge, you know, that sort of the archway there. Um, you could have Cable Stay Bridge, which is a bit like the new uh, Severn Bridge or the, the new Fourth Bridge, where you've got a tower and lots of strands coming out. And the reason why that is very um, popular is because of ease of maintenance, is that if one of those strands becomes corroded or needs replaced, it's resilient in that you can take that strand away and replace it. If our chains on our suspension bridge um, need replaced, it's a much, much difficult job to do and much more costly. So that's why, you know, um, nowadays you look at bridges in terms of repair and maintenance and what, what can be done. But, you know, 20 years down, 30 years down the line, who knows what, um, and that's the same, that's not going to be there in 20 or 30 years time. But, um, you know, bridge, bridge manufacture, bridge design is changing rapidly. We've got plastic bridges now. We're going back to timber bridges. So um, there's lots of ways of doing um, it in the future. So it'd be interesting. Maybe by the time the bridge needs to be replaced, we won't have vehicles. So we'll be looking at, um, you know, some sort of jet propelled thing across or cable cars for pedestrians only. Who knows? You know, we never know what might be happening in the future. We'll all be on hoverboards. <laughs> hoverboards, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Brilliant. Right, this is from George, who is aged four, and he says, how is the bridge held up and how does it stay up in the middle? All oh, right, okay. So I always think of the bridge as a bit like a washing line. So you've got two, you've got your two posts and, um, and they're connected at the, uh, by the towers. And then you've got a washing line that is connected um, between the two towers. And then from that washing line, you've got these long strands, these long vertical rods, which are your clothes pegs, and they hang, that they hold on to the deck. So basically the deck is suspended. That's where you get the, the name suspension bridge. The deck is suspended from the, the washing line, which is the chain uh, by these vertical rods. And that's how it stays up. Oh, what a brilliant explanation. That's really good. I'm adding that to my tour. I'd never thought about a washing line before. Very good. Stealing that, Trish. Thank you. Um, you've mentioned it, but let's just clarify the maximum weight the bridge that uh, the, the bridge can take. Yeah, it, it's uh, four tons. So a four ton vehicle can cross the bridge. That doesn't mean it's only four tons, but that's the maximum vehicle uh, that the bridge can take. But years ago, when it was tested, um, for deflection when it was when it was built they actually put 500 tons on the bridge and it, it moved and then came back up again so um it has taken more i'm not saying 500 tons would be acceptable nowadays because obviously since uh, the bridge was built we've added surfacing and um and the gantry and all of those things so that's actually added to the, the dead weight of the bridge anyway which means then the the weight the live weight which is your traffic has to be less and that's why we stick to four tons and how do you sort of come up with that four ton figure? Is that a, a sort of generic figure that's used elsewhere or has it been specifically designed for the bridge? No, it, it's, a, you, it's analysis. So you, you would model the bridge, you would then load the bridge up with traffic um, and you would, it may not always be that the worst case scenario is if the whole bridge is full of traffic. It may be that one quarter is filled with traffic and the other one's empty and it might get sort of a twisting effect. Um, and so the um, the engineers would have designed, would have assessed it using a a, a, not a model, um, a computer model. Um, and I've done some in the past. I haven't modelled the Clifton Suspension Bridge, but I've I've modelled other bridges where you, you put different types of loading on, and then you can determine at what load it's um, satisfactory. So whether it's four ton, seventeen ton, or um, or whatever. And is that is that a similar reason why the bridge? has to be closed for what used to be the Ashton Court Festival and now the Balloon Fiesta. Um, yeah. And is it necessarily weight or is it movement? Give us it's, an insight into why. Yeah, it's it's more about the dynamic movement because it, it gets into a bit, if you remember the, um, the, the bridge over the Millennium Bridge began to get quite um, lively, as I call it, when there was a lot of people. And it's the same with the Clifton Suspension Bridge. If you get a lot of people crossing it, um, it starts to move, um, uh, you know, more than expected. And then people then tend to get into the same sort of rhythm. And so um, they get into step and that makes it worse and you get a, a much more um, livelier movement, which can be quite distressing for people. And also we don't want that too much of a movement for the bridge. 
So the best thing to do is to is to stop people com coming across the bridge um, on the days of the balloon fe on the on the evenings of the balloon fiesta. During the day, it's not so bad because people sort of stagger their visits. But when it's the night glow, basically it's on a certain time. So then everybody comes sort of 15 minutes before and charges across the bridge. So that's when we get this sort of problem, and that's why we shut it for the sort of the timed timed events. Mm -hmm. Um, let's uh, weave this one in um, again. It's so about bridge closure, but at what wind speed does the bridge close? It, um, it's interesting. It's it's the bridge. It's not about well. It is about the wind speed, but it's more about the direction of the wind. So um, where the the most um, concerning wind would be if it was coming at right angles to the bridge, so coming up the gorge. So coming from um, Avonmouth up through the gorge and hitting the hitting the bridge sort of at, at right angles, um, and that would be the most um, you know potentially damaging um, direction, and and in a way I suppose that's possibly why the bridge is still standing after 150 years because the gorge actually curves round, so I, the wind never really gets a chance to sort of hit the bridge at that at a, a very high speed, um, because it gets buffered by the by the gorge as it comes up through the from um, you know from the from Avonmouth, so um, we have to look at we we look at wind speed and wind direction, um, and then we can also monitor um, how the bridge is moving itself, um, mm. and then decide whether it, the bridge is closed. But we've been very lucky it, in since I've been here three years, it hasn't it hasn't shut to winds, and I think before then it's probably closed two or three times for wind, but for very short periods of time, just for the safety of um, people going across. And also for cyclists, because if it gets too windy, you know, cyclists begin to blow into the line of traffic and pedestrians find it hard to cross the bridge. So it's more for um, the comfort of people as well, um, as well as for the protecting the bridge. Good stuff. You've answered uh, Marcia Louise's question there, which is also how many times has a bridge closed because of high winds? And, and it's surprisingly small, isn't it? I remember, you know, not so long ago, actually sort of it being the, gosh, the bridge was closed to winds for the first time in a long, long time. Yeah. Yeah, it, it doesn't it, it doesn't happen too often um, because we can, because of the direction is, isn't it? That's quite a rare direction um, that we, you know, that when the wind comes up that way. So, uh, We've been very lucky. I don't know whether Brunel knew all that when he was designing it, whether he realised it's a good shield of location. And like if he did, so. he was a very good one. Um, okay, back to one of our SBY students' questions. Thanks for all these, by the way. Great questions. Uh, why are there vaults on the bridge? Uh, right, so um, basically when Brunel wanted, when he wanted to, or when he won the competition, I, he, uh, he wanted to had the span longer than um, than what we have at the minute, and um, and the they, the judges said no, you can't have it that length. It's not going to happen. It's not going to be possible. So the only way around it was he had to actually build the the vaults or build the buttress out into the gorge a little bit so that he could reduce his span. Now the vaults, we're not really sure why he did vaults, but obviously, I would say personally, probably to do with the fact it's economy. Um, you don't, you know, if you have a solid vault, that's a lot of stone that has to be carted in from quarries. Um, if he has, if he has vaults, it means he's got lots of voids within there which don't have to be filled. Therefore, it's cheaper to build. And he would have also had a lot of stone masons and people like that been used to building cathedrals and building, um, you know, those sort of arches that you get in the vaults. Um, so he would have had really experienced people, and they would have been able to say, "Look, let's, I can do this." And um, and, and they've you know, built some fantastic the vaults that we have today, which um, if you haven't visited, it's definitely worth a visit. Definitely do. Definitely worth it. Uh, what percentage of the bridge it. are still the original parts, asks John Gleave on Twitter. Um, I mean, the majority of the bridge, um, I would say about now we've got about 90% of the, is the original ironwork. I mean, the chains are still... I mean, they're a big part of the bridge and they're obviously original. The towers are original. Um, we've occasionally changed a few nuts and bolts over the years, so most of um, them have been changed. But um, the ironwork itself, I would say 90% is there, is, is as original. Um, we've had a, we obviously, or maybe you're not aware, but the deck is, is timber. 
So, um, you know, you're, you're driving across a, a timber deck. Now that has been replaced over the years and um, because it's, it obviously needs to be. So that's the deck has been replaced, but the ironwork itself, I'd say we're on about 90% original features. Such a, that's so cool, isn't it? To, that it's lasted so long, wow. And so when you think that the chains were second hand as well, you know, the, the fact that, you know, we're saying that the bridge is 150, what are we in now, four years old? Um, you know, but the chains are even older than that, you know, and they're still standing and still doing us proud today. <laughs> Oh, what a, what a creation. What a creation. Uh, right. I know that the, this is uh, uh, Moti who's asking this question. I know the fourth row bridge and seven bridge have been severely damaged due to salty water, low temperatures and humid weather. What measures have been taken to protect the Clifton suspension bridge from rust? Well, we have obviously um, regular inspections of the, um, the bridge and the ironwork and the, the chains and, and deck. Um, we do that on a regular basis, so we can we can check to see whether any any rust patches. But we have a really good um, paint system that's on that we use. The bridge gets painted every sort of twenty to twenty five years, so the system lasts that long. It's three coats, so every single little bolt, every little bit of ironwork gets painted with three coats. So it's a long process, quite tedious. Um, last year or the year before, we painted the underside of the deck, if you remember. Um, and we're now just refurbishing and painting the middle third of the rods and then the next plan we will be doing for painting would be the chains and that's the, the challenging bit um, it used to be you sort of walk the chains and, uh, and painted them sort of off a little tiny little gantry um, but we have to look at how we can do that safely in the future but the paint systems are working I mean they, they we have very little um, corrosion or rust on the, on the chains and who chooses the colour? Because it's not always been this colour, has it? No, it hasn't always been that colour. I, I don't know. It, it, I'd have to go back in the records to see why it changed to, it used to be like a brown, didn't it? Brown and, and golden. Um, and I don't know why it, it's changed over the years, but whether they couldn't get it in this paint system, I don't know. I'd have to look back and see. But you'd get to choose the colour, right, if it was going to change, because you're a bridge master. Yeah, because it's listed, because it's a listed structure now, um, obviously whatever we do to the bridge, we have to get permission. So if I was to decide to paint it uh, blue or pink or whatever, um, you, would, you would have to get listed consent. Um, and um, that's, I think, they might be a bit shocked if I decided to change the colour. <laughs> no plans then, no plans. No plans, no. <laughs> um, this is from uh, CJ Tickler as well. Uh, does the bridge have a lifespan or will maintenance see it lasting for years to come? Well, most, most design lives of, of bridges, I think, are about 100. 125 years so we're well past the design life of this bridge but it's regularly maintained it's regularly inspected um, we keep we obviously reduce the um, impact of sort of heavy vehicles because we're keeping it to four ton so at the minute it's in really good condition um, and I can see it going on for a long period of time I mean the plan is it's to be uh, maintained in perpetuity which is forever um, so I, I will um, be planning to make sure that that is the case while, while I'm here and then I shall pass it on to the next bridge master to carry on the, the process. But um, yeah, there's no real concerns as to, as to why it can't um, last another 100 years. Certainly beyond our lifetimes, let's Definitely. hope anyway. Yeah. Um, how, do they main, how do they do maintenance on the bridge or fix the top bits if they break? says one of our students okay so to do any maintenance if i mean usually um, it's inspections rather than repairing uh, bits of break but um we we're, there's different methods so we, one of the ways is um we use cherry pickers which are your sort of mobile platforms that you in the back of a vehicle uh, you sometimes see um bt using it to change the tops of um the, the bt poles so um, we use that, we close the bridge and then we use cherry pickers, some, a really quite large cherry picker to, um, to get up to the, to the top parts of the bridge. Um, and then we also use um, scaffolding when we need to. So a number of years back, we were cleaning all the stone on the towers and that was all completely scaffolded so that they could, they could work off, off scaffold. 
Um, so that's another option. And then also um, we've had in the past, so not so much now, where people actually walk the chains. Um, obviously they're clipped on. Um, so if they had to change the, the LED lights or repair the lights, um, occasionally they will um, walk the chains. So we try to avoid that these days. Um, there's, if there's other options such as using a cherry picker, we will use that instead. And that, that, the, the final maintenance question from one of our students was who changes the light bulb? So that would be our maintenance team then? Uh, we have electricians that come in. We, we used to have light bulbs on the bridge. So basically, they're, you know, they were little screw light bulbs um, and, uh, they, and, they, and they were down the, 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 cable, the, um, the hangers as well. You had little light bulbs. So they were changed on a regular basis by um, the maintenance. But we've moved to LED lights at the minute. So we've got white LED lights. Um, so we have electricians that come in if they need to replace um, some of those. Perfect. Um, I'd like to sort of finish off by uh, asking you, if you can, uh, the highlights so far of your tenure at the bridge. If there was one moment that you'd sort of pick out as being your, your sort of favourite, what, what has your favourite moment been so far? Apart from, apart from uh, the first few weeks when I got here, I obviously went all over the bridge and to be standing at the top on the tower top of the tower and looking across Bristol and, and the view from there was absolutely amazing. And then looking at the bridge and thinking, oh my goodness, I am responsible for this bridge. <laughs> so it was quite amazing. But um, I'm not, I don't know if I've got a, a, a certain, I suppose it was quite nice when we opened the new toll houses. I quite enjoyed that, uh, the fact that um, we had a little bit of a ceremony and uh, we thanked the team and all the contractors and consultants who were working with us. Um, and we had a bit of a, you know, a ribbon cutting. That was quite nice. And I also enjoy um, meeting the schools and uh, going out to schools and talking to them about um, about what I do and what engineering is all about and uh, and what the team do. So um, that's quite too, quite great. I mean, I haven't got one specific highlight. I think each day is um, really enjoyable. Well, I think, I think that's testament to what a wonderful uh, job you have and the fact that probably every day is pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, definitely. Um, and, you know, it's just so, so varied, so interesting. And I'm really lucky because I've got such a really good team uh, to support me. So, I mean, although, you know, you're talking to me, I mean, there's a big, behind me, there's my, my team who work really hard to keep everything um, you know, going and uh, the, the bridge working and the visitor centre open when it, in normal times. Um, so um, I'm very lucky. I've got a really great team. Well, I could talk to you for another couple of hours about all sorts of different things. It's been really enlightening and very, very interesting. But Trish, you've got a bridge to run, so we're going to have to let you go. <laughs> all right, Dainsey. Well, thanks for talking to me. <laughs> Thank you very much. And if you've enjoyed this Q&A and you would like to find out more about the bridge, uh, head to the website and perhaps even making a donation as well, because of course it's you we rely on uh, for those tolls and those donations as well. You can find out everything at cliftonbridge.org.uk forward slash supporters. Trish, thanks very much. Thank you.